six, we eventually were literally speaking to other beings from other worlds as well as the spirit team through this device. And we were seeing spirit lights inside the glass dome. On one occasion, we had the glass dome light up like a light bulb and um, with a red spirit light for about three hours. We did actually have a miniature UFO materialized actually in the room and flew around the room. It was amazing because this little UFO flew around the room sat about two inches in front of the eyes of everyone in the room and so we could see it thoroughly and see little portholes that had lights on them uh, and it was quite amazing. Welcome, Welcome to, to Researchers, Researchers podcast, podcast show, show about ideas and quest for knowledge. It went on for five years and it was happening throughout the 1990s in the small British village school positioned on the borders of two counties, Norfolk and Suffolk. Inside the farmhouse, psychical researchers Robin Foy and his wife Sandra, together with two mediums, Diana and Alan Bennett, were able to achieve extraordinary results during their spiritistic sessions, which are now known as school experiments. Wide range of anomalies was recorded, light phenomena, object movement, upwards, materialization of hand, levitation, two-way communication with intelligent entities, and so on. Variety of scientists and researchers were direct witnesses of those sessions, including Dr. Rupert Sheldrake, who had physical interaction with materialized hand. Different manifestations were caught on photographic film, audio tape, and videotape, which were also reviewed by Society for Psychical Research in their 1999 report. Back in 2013, I received a journalistic assignment to interview Mr. Foy for Creation Television and Creation Magazine Light. For the first time, I am releasing full audio of that interview, so now it will be widely available. Robin Foy is the direct witness of school experiments. He has been there from the beginning and saw it all. He is also author of the book Witnessing the Impossible. Interview with Robin Foy happened on February 19, 2013, while he was in Spain, where he also currently lives now. I just had a recent contact with him. He will actually try to recreate school experiments in a new location. As you will be able to hear, school findings could imply that human personalities have continuation after physical death. On top of that, there were also some other complex factors that were encountered as reported by participants. Two other books were published in relation to these events. The School Experiment, Scientific Evidence for Life After Death by Grant and Jane Solomon, The School Report by Montague Keane, Arthur Ellison and David Fontana. My interview with Robin Foy was not only a journalistic assignment, it was actually something more personal for me. It was my tool to satisfy personal curiosity in relation to different aspects regarding phenomena of high strangeness and different range of manifestation that it seems could be produced when certain conditions are met. So I hope that school experiments will become more widely recognizable and I'm releasing my interview so it could additionally serve to raise the awareness of those events. So coming up, my archived interview with Robin Foy from February 19, 2013. Thank you, Mr. Robin Foy, for your time today. Uh, before we start with complex uh, narrative of school uh, experiments, uh, tell me something about yourself and how your journey with psychical research and paranormal phenomena started. And in your case, you had an interest uh, for specific type of paranormal phenomena that is challenging our current understanding of the world. Well. I've always been interested in psychic matters right from a childhood. Um, 
my parents um, always used to joke with me whenever we went past different houses that they were haunted. And I took an interest from that time onwards, really. Started to um, get ghost books for my early birthday presents and uh, generally was quite interested. My mother was naturally psychic and could have developed as a very good clairvoyant. Um, but in fact, she never did, although she did used to go and have sittings with mediums uh, on several occasions. And then on one occasion, she pointed out um, a spiritualist church to me in the town where I grew up in Grimsby in Lincolnshire. Uh, that's in the United Kingdom uh, on Humberside. And uh, she said that was a spiritualist church. Well, I'd not really heard the term spiritualist before. But then um, I started to imagine all sorts of things happening uh, in the church and things flying around inside. So I was even more fascinated and I started to read up a little bit about spiritualism and things like that. Uh, and I had a couple of paranormal experiences myself um, when I got to the age of 18 and went into the RAF Air Force in, uh, in the UK. Uh, I heard on, on two different occasions... I heard a woman's voice coming clearly out of um, out of the air, um, firstly telling me that you can heal with your hands. Uh, and uh, being quite a, a lively young fellow, I sort of ran out into the corridor and started sticking my hands on everybody that was around. But being a pilot at the time there, nobody really needed uh, any healing. They were all fit fellows. Uh, and so they all thought I was a bit of a, a bit of an idiot. Uh, and later on, I actually heard a similar voice um, telling me that I was going to marry a certain woman, um, which then occurred. Uh, although my first uh, marriage didn't work out, uh, certainly, um, you know, sort of these things that were predicted came to be. And I found out later that I was, in fact, a healer uh, and I could do spiritual healing. And I had some very good results with it. Um, but it was about 39 years ago. I'm now nearly 70. It was about 39 years ago that I first came into it properly um, when I answered, answered an advert in a local paper in, the, in an area of, of uh, the UK called Leicester, a, a city there, which was asking for people who were interested uh, in psychic research um, to get in touch with this particular box number that was in the paper. And although it didn't in reality stand out in broad type in the local paper, this advert uh, looked to me as though it did. Uh, and I thought, well, you know, I'll, I've got nothing to lose. I'll give that a try and um, I'll get in touch with them. And in fact, I did just that. Um, I wrote to this box number and eventually got a telephone call from the people there um, saying that they wanted me to come along for an interview. Now, I'd never really had any experience of the um, what we call mental mediumship, clairvoyance, clairaudience, um, etc. Uh, and when I got to this um, this group that was interested in the research, I discovered that they were a physical circle. Now I didn't really know what that was until the chap explained exactly what it was all about. Uh, and uh, as he was interviewing us, um, he asked us all. He said he, he said that they were sitting to try and get um, physical phenomena. Uh, and that the circle already had some minor results. And uh, we were all being sort of interviewed, and then he said, would we like to look at the room that he used for the sittings? And everybody said yes. And we filed up the um, uh, in single line up the stairs to see this room, which was actually an extension of his, bed his bedroom over the garage. Uh, and uh, as we were going up the stairs, I clearly heard uh, another... Um, clairaudient clip if you like and, and that I heard a baby crying quite loudly on the stairs and so did everybody else that was walking up the stairs hmm. now there were no babies in the house uh, and the, the house itself was detached so that there was quite a distance between that house and, and the house next door on, our, on both sides so it seemed very odd that I should hear that uh, and uh, as I sort of went up and saw this room and we agreed it was a it was a decent room um, I uh, then said to the, you know the, the guy offered three of us the rest were told to go home they were they weren't suitable but he offered three of us the chance to join his physical circle and I agreed to do that 
And I mentioned to him that I'd heard this um, uh, baby crying on the stairs, and he said, maybe this is a spirit message for you, telling you, um, you know, something of the future. And I said, well, okay, you know, I'd not really come across this before. And then within a week, um, the wife and I, uh, well, my, my first wife and I, um, actually were offered the chance to adopt a, a little baby boy. Hmm. Uh, and so, bingo, it turned out to be 100% correct. Uh, and uh, we adopted um, two children uh, in my first marriage. Uh, and, uh, you know, sort of, I, I caught the bug from there on because I got very interested in this, in this and the early sittings that we had in this group were extremely good. We used to get whistles in the air. We used to get um, wraps along the wall, like little fingers running back on the back of the wall. Um, a number of us were occasionally poked in the back by a, a, a materialized finger, um, which nobody could have actually stood behind any of the chairs and done that because all the chairs were, were tightly against the wall. Uh, and in this circle, uh, the chap that ran it, and he'd been running circles for years, was very friendly with a famous medium called Leslie Flint. Uh, Leslie Flint was a voice medium, uh, independent voice. Yeah, that and was... The guy that, you yeah. know, you remember Leslie, yeah? yeah yes, uh, that was actually my second question that I just wanted to ask you. I saw reference in one of your articles that you attended a number of seances with Flint. Uh, can you go deeper into that, since there is also a huge volume of material and audio recordings about uh, Flint's uh, sessions? That's absolutely correct. And uh, the, the long and the short of it was that this uh, circle leader used to take his circle to see Leslie Flint and have a sitting with him about every six months. Uh, and so whilst I was with that circle, I think I actually stayed in that circle about 18 months. Uh, we went to Leslie Flint's about three times. Uh, and the very first time I was there, um, we sat down in total darkness uh, and all of these spirit voices came and talked with us from um, speaking from midair. Uh, and it was a fantastic experience. And uh, uh, from that moment onwards, I was really deeply interested in physical phenomena uh, and I vowed there and then to follow up um, anything and the research that anything I could discover about uh, Leslie, about um, physical mediumship and so forth and so on. So from, from that time onwards, I started to really delve into the subject. And then um, I had to go down south to, uh, to work, so I moved away from Leicester and couldn't be in that circle anymore. Um, but I went to London, uh, and as just before I went to London, I put my own advert uh, into a, uh, a psychic newspaper called the Psychic News, uh, asking for anybody in the London area uh, that was interested in developing physical mediumship, physical phenomena, um, to get in touch. Uh, and one particular chap um, wrote over to me. Uh, his name was, um, uh, or he was... It was actually called John Squires, uh, and he lived in Romford. Uh, and uh, Romford is in Essex, and it's only just outside London, about 20 miles outside London. Uh, and over a period, once I got down there, I started to sit in this circle um, with John Squires and his landlady, who uh, really wasn't into the subject but sat in there anyway. Uh, and we started to get some really good results. He was the most fantastic trance medium. Uh, and he brought through he, people speaking in trance, um, some people that we never heard of, some people that had been quite famous in their lifetime. Mm. Uh, and it was it was looking very good. But unfortunately, he was quite an ill man. He um, um, he had sort of severe depression uh, and it was very difficult sometimes to actually get him to sit. So um, the circle was was on and off, on and off for, mm. for quite some time. But in the meantime, I'd, I'd sat in other circles. I'd got used to the whole situation. Um, myself, I'd delved into, into mental mediumship at that time and had private sittings with nearly 200 mediums whilst I'd been there. Um, but along the short of it was that for a while I left that circle uh, and then my marriage split up um, and I came back to that circle eventually um, and met there my second wife, and we've been married now nearly 34 years. Um, but her 
interest was very much like mine, physical mediumship. And between us, we, we've um, run many, many circles over the years. Some have been wonderful. We've got some very, very good phenomena. And between us at Romford, when we went back there, we developed uh, this physical medium, John Squires, to a tremendous level where he was getting independent voice as good as Leslie Flint's. Uh, and, um, you know, sort of not only that, but levitation and various other things happening there. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it looked very, very good. And in the meantime, all the time, I'd ma been making private appointments with Leslie Flint over the years. Uh, and we used to go ourselves about once every six months or so to see Leslie. So I kept in constant contact with him. Uh, and whilst Leslie was alive, um, I, I think we went in total about 25, 26 times and had wonderful wow. sittings with him. So, you know, there was, there was an awful lot of things were happening there. Um, and then when we got married, my second wife and I, we ran our own circles. We had some good results occasionally. Uh, and things built up and then we'd we'd lose them we had sitters came and sitters went and it wasn't really stable we weren't getting a, a really stable conditions at that time mm. but eventually we'd been married a number of years and we moved um into norfolk um mm. which which is um in the east anglia area of the uk uh and we we settled in a little village called skoll which mm. is right on on the border uh, of Norfolk and Suffolk, the two counties of the UK. Um, and it was there that we managed to build up um, a, a group of people um, because I was running a couple of other operations at that time. My wife and I helped to create a, an organization called the um, ISM Home Circle Link, and we ran that for a few years. And then eventually um, we created an organization called the Noah's Ark Society, um, which Spirit had asked me to do in a, in, in a physical sitting with, with um, a different medium. Over the years, we sat with many physical mediums, uh, and uh, the Noah's Ark Society was there to try and bring back physical mediumship. Uh, and I started that in 1990, uh, and it became very, very popular. We had members all over the world. We had circles. We were helping to sit for phenomena. Uh, and I, we both stayed in that, my wife and I, um, for um, about four years until 1994. But in 1993, and during that time in, in the link, we'd actually had a couple of mediums who, um, or n not in the link, sorry, in, in the Noah's Ark Society, we'd had a couple of, of physical mediums joined us, uh, and they were demonstrating for members of the Noah's Ark Society. Uh, and some of those demonstrations took place in our home at Skoll. Mm. And we'd had a seance room actually um, purposely built uh, in the cellar of that, that place. Uh, and uh, we, were, you know, we, we had several members came and actually um, sat with us in, in some of those demonstrations. But our own group started in 1990, at the end of 1992 uh, and ran into 1993. By the end of 93. We were getting some wonderful results um, in that we were getting physical results very, very quickly. Uh, we had two people that were involved in that circle um, who were, in fact, both physical mediums and trans mediums. Uh, Diana and Dallin Bennett, right? That's correct, yes. Yeah. Uh, and they both developed very, very quickly as physical mediums. Uh, and through them, we were getting instructions from the members of our spirit team um, to build certain apparatus for them, to help them in certain ways so they could develop the phenomena that we all wanted. Yeah, and uh, on that point I uh, wanted to ask you, uh, so that was the beginning of school experiments and it seems that enormous patience in your case uh, produced uh, extraordinary results uh, in the end. Uh, in fact, if I'm not mistaken, in the beginning you didn't receive any results that could be characterized as impressive. Um, the, the first results at all, um, mm -hmm. we had about May in 1993, uh, and we, we started sitting in December 1992, mm -hmm. and the first results that we properly got were in May 1993. We were not aware of the fact that we were actually sitting in a different way 
uh, from the way people had sat in the past, which was an mm. ectoplasm-based way. But the, the first phenomena we got was that the trumpet fell over one week while we were sitting off the table, and then the next week it actually gently removed itself from the table, levitated, and then went very, very gradually down to the floor. So that was the first, and then really... Uh, we didn't get any more phenomena at all, although we were sitting week in, week out and trying to develop it until the October of that year. And on that occasion, um, we actually had an apport uh, of a coin which was called a Churchill crown. Uh, and that Churchill crown arrived during the sitting. Um, we heard it drop onto the table quite loudly. Uh, and then after, through trance, we were told... Um, that a friend of mine, I mean, I'd, for many years, I'd had a, a, a psychic contact with Winston Churchill. Uh, mm -hmm. And I was told that this apport was a sign of greater things to come. From yes. that moment onwards, everything started to really take off. Uh, and within a few weeks, we had amazing things happening. Um, there were more apports. Um, there was the actual... Trance speech they were uh, they were producing the two mediums was changing so that it started to move away from them and the voices were coming out of the walls and everything um, and then with the group we had we had some work done um, with, with photography psychic photography uh, and then we started to get different things happening we started to get voices coming out of midair. But our spirit team were very careful to explain to us uh, that, in fact, what they were doing was totally different um, from the, uh, the traditional method of working with physical phenomena, which had always in the past been done with ectoplasm. We were told that what was happening with us um, w was actually um, being done with energy, only a, a mixture of three different types of energy. Uh, and that this was actually pioneering work that we were doing in, in, in cooperation with them. Uh, and we were pioneering a brand new way of working, which was much, much quicker um, to develop phenomena than in, in, in the way that they'd done it in the past. Because traditionally speaking, using the um, ectoplasm-based way, um, Many, many mediums uh, who, who developed in the past and became famous mediums got absolutely nothing for six, seven, eight years. Uh, and in, in one case, I remember a story of um, uh, a lady physical medium uh, who had been sitting with her husband um, twice a week for eight years and got absolutely nothing. Uh, and one day they sort of came together and they said, OK, we've sat for eight years, we've got nothing. Um, if nothing happens tonight, that's it. We're never wow. going to sit again. And they sat uh, and nothing happened. And they said, OK, that's it. You know, and as they got up to walk out of the room, the table followed them. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, after that, the development came fairly quickly. But that was a traditional way. In fact, Leslie Flint himself uh, took almost 12 years to fully develop his mediumship. Uh, and... Uh, that in itself shows how dedicated he was in, in getting that development. And that's how it was always done in the past. With this new method, people can do it in months rather than years. Uh, and the website that I now run, I help people uh, on that website to be able to, um, uh, to learn more about it. Uh, and we have about 2,200 members on there now from all over the world. Um, a lot of those are actually physical mediums, and a lot of them are, are groups that are sitting for physical mediumship today. And most of them are actually sitting in the new way, the energy-based way, and getting results much quicker. Uh, and our spirit team, during the Skull experiment, actually dictated for us um, a basic guide, which is about 70 pages long, uh, and which... If anybody follows that basic guide, they can generally manage to develop some phenomena fairly quickly. And we've got a lot of people all over the world are, are using that method now and getting some good results. Wow. Well, it shows that this phenomena will not happen just like that. Uh, you must include enormous uh, time and patience, as we can see in your case. 
And on television, we can see so many ghost shows uh, and they don't have any real impact. They are just filming them from episode to episode with artificial tension and no real data. Uh, and from that perspective, I think that your case is extraordinary. Um, you actually had to devote your life to something like that. Uh, and I have one additional question. Uh, can you tell us uh, who were the members of the so-called spirit team? Uh, can you tell us more about that? And later uh, I will have more questions about the manifestation of phenomena. Yes, I, I certainly can. Um, they, uh, the spirit team made a point uh, of telling us that they were using pseudonyms um, that were not their real name because they didn't want at that time the public um, to know exactly who they were, uh, mainly because we were actually inviting scientists to come in uh, and um, uh, inspect our work and, and, you know, to sort of sit with us. Yeah. Uh, and, and they didn't want those scientists to know exactly who they were. Um, but we had a number. There was a William, uh, and he, he, in fact, in real life was William Crooks. We had a Joseph, um, who in real life was Oliver Joseph Lodge. Um, we, we had, um, uh, an Edwin, um, who in fact was, was actually Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Oh. Um, wow. and we had an Emily who never did give us her, her real name because she had family that was still living. Um, and she referred to herself as Mrs. Emily Bradshaw. Um, but we never did actually find out who she was. She'd been quite a lady in her time, I think. Um, and, and quite, uh, high socially, but we, we didn't know who, who she was in real life. Um, there was um, uh, a defrock priest, an Irish defrock priest who, who uh, sat with us. He was Patrick. Uh, and we had a, uh, an Indian, um, uh, had been an, an Indian uh, soldier called Raji that, um, that was one of the main team as well. So there were quite a few of the main team, but we also got quite a few of what I always term dropping communicators. And they are people in the spirit world who have been interested in, in this work in their own lifetime. Uh, and they tend to, to drop into one circle and communicate a bit. Then they'll actually drop into several circles. So they're not anybody's guides. Uh, they, they just happen to be people who want to help with the work. Yeah. At some stage, as you said, uh, you concluded that the results are so extraordinary uh, that you decided to bring paranormal researchers, uh, scientists, uh, especially people from SPR, Society for Psychical Research from London, where different sets of controls uh, were applied to experiments. Uh, can you tell us something about results, uh, for example, evidence with photographs, uh, films, uh, canister of, of Polaroid film, 35 millimeter uh, results that you were getting? Uh, they are very fascinating. Yeah, I mean, to begin with, um, the, um, uh, the first photographic results we got were with ordinary 35 millimeter film mounted into, um, into two um, at SLR 35 millimeter cameras. Um, we were told to bring them down to the, uh, uh, to the room when we sat. Uh, and on the first occasion that we started to get proper, um, stuff there, we actually, um, put, uh, one camera, um, on a chair, on a vacant chair, uh, and Sandra, my wife held another camera, uh, and, uh, the, um, spirit team told us that whenever they said now, Sounder was to point the camera in the middle of the, the room in the darkness and just take a, take a photograph, which she did. Uh, and they ran through the whole film that way. And then a little bit later on in the sitting, um, the second camera, which had been um, placed on a chair, had actually levitated and started taking um, pictures by itself and winding wow. itself on. Uh, and when we had those films developed afterwards, we couldn't at first believe they were our own films um, because they had all sorts of different images on them. There were 11 images on each of the films uh, and all sorts of different subjects. Um, there were pictures of different people. Funnily enough, in those early days, um, one of the um, pictures we got was a photograph of, of Conan Doyle. You know, he, he'd obviously put on there because he was a member of the team and he was mm -hmm. trying to identify himself. 
Um, but uh, that was quite an amazing result. And for a while, we got a few results like that. And then we started to work with Polaroid films, which to begin with, um, and we, we did that because we actually went along to Polaroid and spoke to them. Uh, and they were good enough to say, yes, they would try and back us with our investigations. So they gave us a lot of 35 millimeter Polaroid films, um, which we never put in the camera at all. But purely, first of all, we left them still rolled up on the table uh, during a sitting. And we got some very good results, different frames on, on the films doing that. Uh, and then finally, um, we were told, no, now we can we can get results. Um, we want you to actually leave them uh, in, in the shop bought plastic carton. So, in fact, they never came out of that at all. They went mm. straight into the uh, into the room where we were sitting and we were placed on the table in the sealed carton. They've come from the shopping. Uh, and uh, we started to get the most amazing stuff on there, all sorts of pictures, pictures of different places in the spirit world, pictures of stars, um, pictures of areas in the spirit world they described as areas of communication um, where there appeared to be clouds on the picture, but the clouds turned into faces, and it, w it was quite an amazing situation with all those photographs we got. And then when uh, the three investigators, um, we had um, uh, Montague Keane, yes. Professor David Fontana, uh, and Professor Arthur Ellison, came from the, the SPR and started to sit with us on a regular basis. Um, they uh, um, complicated it a bit further by asking us to put these films in the sealed containers into a wooden box, which is a security box, yeah. um, to make e even sure, sure even further that um, nobody had touched them during that time. Uh, and uh, they actually sat with us on a number of occasions in the UK um, and in, in um, uh, Ibiza, um, in, in the Balearic Islands, uh, and in the USA. Monty Keem came out with us then when we went and did a, a little tour in, uh, in yeah, California. I know. Uh, mm -hmm. And he, you know, he, he did sit with us a couple of times on, on those occasions as well. well. So, you know, we, we got some quite amazing results. Um, with those photographic results and on occasions um, we would get the complete film of four four feet over a meter long um, completely covered in in uh, writing or what have you and some of the writing we got on there um, covered the whole film we had um, poems from Wordsworth um, we had um, a blueprint of a device that Spirit wanted us to make. Ah, the, the, um, the modification of tape tape recorder, right? Um, that well, that that wasn't ah. really. They ah, wanted okay. us to actually build a special device. Ah, okay. Uh, and we referred to that as our TDC device, um, which stood for Trans Dimensional Communication Device. Uh, and the okay. blueprint for that um, appeared on a film during one of our sessions. Uh, with the initials after it, T-A-E, uh, and that turned out to be Thomas Edison, uh, who was, was actually telling us what to do and how to make this, which we did, and it took an awful long time for it to work properly, but eventually we were literally, the very first person to speak through it properly was Thomas Edison himself, wow. uh, and he spoke to us for about 15 minutes, um, of which actually all of these things were recorded at the time. And those recordings still exist, although they've never been made public. Um, but, you know, we eventually were literally speaking um, to other beings from other worlds, um, as well as the spirit team, through this device. Can you describe us the box in question? Were there any electronic uh, components in it? No, it's, 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 quite, it's very small. You wouldn't believe to see uh -huh. it that it could actually work. But the, it, 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 there was just two very small coils uh, and a chip of germanium, the, the um, metal germanium. And it worked extremely well in the end, and we were getting some really remarkable voice messages, um, and it was literally voice-to-voice -voice communication through this device. And we were told by the spirit team um, that the device worked on an idolis system, which stood for inter 
dimensional oral language interpretation system. So virtually what they were saying was that these other beings, um, I don't know, some appeared to be having a life on another planet, some appeared to be having a life without a body at all, but they were able to speak through this. And of course, their natural, normal language was not the same as ours. But through this system, because it was a, an oral language interpretation system, it was coming out of the device actually in English, um, but almost in a robotic way. So you, it didn't appear to be a normal person's voice, more of a robotic voice. Mm -hmm. uh, that reminds me of George Meek's uh, Spiricom device. Was it that kind of robotic voice? Very, very, very similar, I think, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, did it have any kind of speakerphone or voices went just through the box? Um, no, the, the voices went through the box ah, and okay. the box itself was plugged into mm. the um, uh, into the microphone socket ah, okay. um, of an ordinary small cassette tape recorder. So it used the speakerphone from the cassette uh, recorder? The oh. amplifier from the cassette, ah. yes. Another uh, extraordinary fact is that Professor uh, Archie Roy, astronomer, uh, had a discussion with the other side about celestial mechanics, uh, right? That's correct, yes, yes. What were uh, his thoughts about it uh, after that discussion? Um, well, he, he was very much in favor, and he, he believed that it was the person that he'd spoken to about a particular experiment uh, that we knew absolutely nothing about um, was a genuine scientist in the spirit world who was um, involved in his own specialist subject. Uh, and uh, he had a long conversation um actually a, a, about this very subject and he was 100% sure afterwards that none of us would have known anything at all about this and that it was totally genuine. Let's talk about uh, materialization of different objects, uh, like you said, upwards. Uh, in one instance, you received all the newspapers from the other side and you also received instructions uh, to build uh, Glastone. Um, yes, the uh, the glass dome came fairly early on in it. The oh, okay. uh, the newspapers that were apported, um, I think we had two actually different newspapers. The first one that we had apported um, had a story about Winston Churchill in it uh, mm -hmm. and was going back to 1945. Um, the second and the second one that was apported was a newspaper from 1944. Uh, and had it was dated, I think, about April 1944, and it had a story in there about the materialization medium uh, Helen Duncan and how unfortunately she she had um, been taken to court uh, and had had been convicted of being a witch and sent to prison, uh, and that was done by the government. And the reason that that was done. Um, was purely and simply because she was a genuine materialization medium. People used to, spirit people materialize through her. And on one occasion, she was having a seance um, in Portsmouth uh, during the Second World War. Uh, and during, during the war there, um, a sailor materialized from a boat called um, the HMS Barham, which was a warship. Uh, and uh, his mother, it, she, he materialized to his mother who was there uh, and told her he had been in this boat, the HMS Barham, and that had been sunk. But the government had never let anybody know in wartime that that boat had been hmm. sunk. So they were very worried because it was not too long before D-Day in 1944, and they were very worried that somebody was going to come through, going to materialize through Helen Duncan, and actually give away secrets to the enemy. Oh. So that's why they, they, they actually trumped up a charge, basically. under The only thing they could, they, they yeah. could um, and, accuse her of was yeah. being a witch, and that was the only thing. They, they sent her to prison for six months, even, at which time, of course, D-Day was over, and uh, you know everybody in the Allies was sort of forging forward. Interesting thing is that they decided to go with a witch charge, uh, and we are here speaking about 1940s. That, that's it, exactly. Wow. And of course, the, the, those two apports, the two papers, um, a small piece of those papers was submitted by Monty Keane um, to the, the um, uh, PIRA, which is the Paper Industry Research Association, mm. um, to check 
the date of the paper and was it genuine wartime paper? Uh, and it came back, it's 100% genuine uh, paper from the wartime. When we received those two apports, both of them were in pristine condition, apart from actually being folded up slightly uh, and looked as though they were actually from the time um, because it's well known that, that newspaper in those days became yellow very, very quickly when it was subjected to sunlight because of all the impurities in the paper. Uh, and the paper we received wasn't yellow, but although when we received it, we put it immediately in, into lightproof and, and uh, airproof containers, within a week it had gone yellow. Can we now go back shortly to uh, Glassdom that we previously mentioned? Uh, you said that it happened fairly early in the experiments. Uh, what was the purpose of that uh, Glassdom? Well, the, the fact was that um, we were working in a new way, um, using only a mixture of three different types of energy. Um, the first type of energy came from us, from the sitters in the room. Um, the second type of energy was spirit energy, which our spirit team brought with them. The third type of energy was natural earth energy, um, which exists in certain places in, in, in the world uh, in a spiral format. Uh, and our spirit team was mixing these three energies together to form what they called a creative energy. Now, we were asked to provide this glass dome for them, uh, and they used the glass dome for storing the creative energy they made out of the three different types of energy, which they then used to produce phenomena. Mm. So some kind of light phenomena uh, or something else? Um, well, it was used for all the different phenomena that we were getting in uh, the group at that time. But uh, in the early days, they were um, doing a lot of experiments with light phenomena. And we were seeing spirit lights inside the glass dome. On one occasion, we had the glass dome light up like a light bulb um, with a spirit light, a red spirit light, um, for about three hours. Wow, wow. Uh, you, you also witnessed uh, musical phenomena and uh, there were some cases of healing phenomena, I think, in the United States, right? Well, we, we, mm -hmm. we actually were asked by the spirit team again to do healing at the uh, absent healing at the end of each of our sessions. And we did that. Uh, and uh, we did absent healing for people all over the world. And we had some remarkable cures happen in Australia. Uh, and this also happened physically, um, while we were doing our experiments in California. Uh, and there were a, a couple of people who sat with us during those sessions um, who'd been ill uh, and who, who were helped very much by the, the um, phenomena that, that occurred then. There was one lady, for instance. With cancer, right? Uh, she, one guy oh, yeah. had, had had cancer, yes, oh, okay. and that was very much helped. One guy had a heart problem, which was helped. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lady had really bad problems with her knees, She'd had very bad pains in her knees for years, uh, and she sat with us on one occasion there. And one of our little spirit lights, actually during the session, went into her knee, and immediately after the sitting, um, she had no more pain in that knee. She'd had pains in, in the knee for years, uh, and she was so pleased with it that the next week she came back again for a second sitting. And uh, the, the second sitting, little light went to, into her other knee, uh, and she was very, very pleased with the way it was all working um, because obviously she was healed in both her knees and as far as I know, to this day, she's never had problems again. I also think that some manifestations were so explicit that when I was reading about them, they left an impression on me. Uh, one of those situations was the manifestation of the hand during one of the sessions. Can we say that that hand was a product of ectoplasm? Of course, uh, you have many testimonials from people who were guests uh, on these sessions. And during this manifestation of hand, uh, even Dr. Rupert Sheldrake was there to witness that. Yes, in, indeed. Um, i got to stress to begin with mm -hmm. that it wasn't ectoplasm. Ah, okay, okay. Um, because of the fact we were only working with energy-based phenomena, ah, that it was, was done difference. in a totally okay. different way. We had materialization, um, but in, in, in fact, um, 
the uh, the materialized personalities um sometimes totally solid to us were teleported from the spirit world into our um into our sessions through a portal which had been made by the spirit team uh so that these people were able to do just that so it wasn't a question of ectoplasm building up as it does with an ectoplasmic medium into a form um, that looks totally like a human being. It was actually the spirit person themselves um, being teleported um, into our room and the spiritual essence that came with them, um, they were able to actually make much more solid um, but it was done in a totally different way from the way it's been done in traditionally with ectoplasm. But yes, uh, Rupert Sheldrake saw Spirit Hand. Many, many, many people who sat with us, hundreds, um, had the same experience, but not just a Spirit Hand. Many were able to actually see in the Spirit Lights that were brought on occasions um, the materialized Spirit Being sitting with us. Yeah, and uh, that hand also touched uh, Rupert by the shoulder, so that will be a physical interaction. Absolutely. And we, uh, as the, the Skull Experimental Group, were having a physical interaction virtually with every sitting from the second year. Wow. Uh, also, it was interesting that you were involved in so-called uh, Project Alice. It reminds me a lot on video transcommunication phenomena, when researchers are filming white noise on the television screen yes. with a camera. Uh, what was uh, the difference or what were the similarities in relation to that method compared with Project Alice? Well, with the, with the video camera, um, we called it Project Alice because um, the, the uh, most important element that we had in the room at the time was, was a mirror. Uh, and it was done through the mirror. That's, uh, that's why we called it Project Alice, as in Alice in Wonderland. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you've come across the book Alice in Wonderland about course, yeah. the girl that went through a mirror. Uh, yeah. uh, and that was a similar sort of thing. But we had the mirror there and there was a special um, setup. It took us a long, long time to get it absolutely right for the spirit team. But we always followed their instructions. Uh, and gradually we started to get the most remarkable um, pictures occurring and bearing in mind that this was all being done in total darkness. Um, we got the most remarkable pictures occurring um, on our video camera, uh, which were totally animated. And we had, I mean, one of our favorites um, was of a, 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 a blue um, e e e a blue extraterrestrial um, ET, basically. Yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, we called him Blue. But that, that chap actually materialized on two or three different occasions uh, in our room there, stood in front of us. Um, picked up our hands and allowed us to feel his head and his, his, his face and his body to show us that he wasn't actually human. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, we, we've got a great fondness for that, that character, Blue. And the amazing thing is that since um, mm -hmm. the Skull Experiment finished, we've actually had him materialize again on a, on a couple of occasions. So we've been able to interact with him physically again. That part is very interesting to me. Uh, can you please expand more on that? Uh, was there any insight what was the source, origin of that extraterrestrial entity? And uh, were there any conversations uh, about the UFO phenomena? Um, no, although, again, uh, we did have on one occasion... Or no, so, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, on about three occasions, we did actually have a miniature UFO materialized actually in the room and flew around the room. Uh, that happened on, on about three occasions, I think. One, one or two of those were when we had visitors. So it was amazing because this, this little UFO flew around the room, mm. sat about two inches in front of the eyes of everyone in the room, and so we could see it thoroughly and see little portholes that had lights on them. Uh, and it was quite amazing. So would you say that the source of that appearance came from somewhere else that was not the spiritual world? Can we say that someone was trying uh, to use the same portal for these appearances? No, I mean, it was, okay. it was in conjunction with the spirit team. The spirit team worked together and in cooperation with the other dimensions. They made it absolutely clear to us that these 
two people were working together, spirit team on one side uh, and the ET team on the other. Um, but they were both working with us. Can we say then that extraterrestrial team was uh, from this universe or uh, the source was uh, from somewhere else? Either from another dimension okay. or another universe. So uh, there was no no any any kind of talk about the uh, correlation with current UFO phenomena that many people report. Uh, um, okay. We never really got okay. as far as we were able to to um, have long communications with them because unfortunately, um, because of, there were some complications with the whole setup, so that in the end um, there was a team in our future, uh, an experimental team in our future. Um, certainly not a, a bad team in any way, shape, or form. I read about um, it, yes. But they, they are, um, they were basically just mm. an experimental team that were investigating, but they lived actually in our future. Uh, and they were somehow connecting with us. They were using what was known, and we were told about it by the spirit mm. people, a crystal probe, um, which unfortunately, every time we sat, they were able to connect into our work. Uh, and out out of this came a, a most awful sort of hideous whine um, whining noise that stopped the mediums being in trance. Uh, and eventually, um, they were the spirit team weren't able to put it right. And of course, that's why the whole thing was closed down. But it was five five wonderful years. Uh -huh. So it was some kind of uh, communication from the future. Uh, are you maybe aware about the famous uh, Rendlesham UFO incident from 1980? Oh, absolutely. And yeah. Skull was not, you know, Skull yeah, wasn't very South far of, away. Yeah, and for example, witness uh, of that incident, uh, James Peniston. Uh, yes. Uh, was hypnotically regressed uh, at some point, uh, and during that uh, hypnotic session at least if we try to interpret the transcript, uh, there were also some references uh, towards possible source of Rendlesham anomaly, which allegedly came uh, from the future. Yeah. Uh, so it was interesting to hypothesize uh, if uh, there is a correlation. Who knows if there is a connection there? Uh, can we now move discussion towards uh, crystal with light that was in one moment physical and in another uh, was not? And you also had uh, experience with table that was levitating and spinning, and I think that happened in California. It certainly did, yes. Um, I'd never seen anything quite like it. it, it, it even uh, we, we were sitting there with our mouths agape. <laughs> um, and they, it, it happened in, in uh, Los Angeles there. Uh, and on that round table, all the crystals have been placed in the normal way. So there was a big crystal in the middle, um, and, and there were four crystals at the points of the compass, north, south, east, and west, just sitting on the table. Um, but the table levitated um, in front of everybody there, turned on its side, so that in reality, under normal circumstances, everything that was on that table should have fallen off it. Wow. And then it started to spin like a like a cartwheel or a Catherine wheel, uh, and it just went round and round and round so fast, um, and it was like that for probably almost five minutes, uh, and then gradually it turned back onto uh, onto its legs again and and slowly sort of fell to the floor, uh, and when we looked at the table afterwards, um, not one of those five crystals had moved. Um, they were exactly in the same place as we put them in the beginning. Yeah. And that was that was certainly quite amazing. But the one thing that totally convinced um, Professor Arthur Ellison uh, that what we were doing at Skoll was 100% genuine um, was the experiment with the crystal in the bowl. Mm, tell us more about it. And the, yes. the, the three investigators were there. Uh, and what happened was that um, a, a, a hand, in fact picked up the crystal, um, and the crystal had a spirit light inside it. It was a big crystal. The, the crystal had a spirit light inside it, and the spirit hand picked up the crystal and dropped it into the, into the bowl. It was a, a round bowl, a sort of oven-proof round bowl. Uh, and uh, as the crystal fell into the bowl, it, it, it could be seen by everybody there, uh, and it still had the light inside it. Uh, and each of the scientists was asked in turn to pick up the crystal, which they did. They all confirmed 
whilst they could still see it, that it was a norm, it, it was normal size, uh, and it felt a normal weight, and in fact, it was real. Um, each one in turn was then asked to put the crystal down back into the bowl, which they did. Nothing changed. It appeared to be exactly the same as it was beforehand, but they were asked to pick it up again. And the second time they tried to pick it up, although it appeared to be exactly the same as it had been previously, their fingers just went through it. It wasn't there. Wow. And that was quite, quite amazing. Uh, and then, of course, they were asked, each of them was asked a third time to pick it up after they, they'd all done this experiment and it was done three times. They were all asked to sort of pick it up a third time. It had stayed in total um, vision all the time that this thing had been going on. Uh, and the third time, of course, it was back to normal. And so they were able to pick it up and say, yes, you know, this is solid. Um, but the, the spirit team explained to us that what had happened um, was that when it wasn't there or, or apparently wasn't there, although we could still see it, what remained was the spiritual essence of the crystal. And it looked exactly like the, the solid crystal. Um, and they explained that this was a spiritual essence of the crystal. And then they explained to us that when we die, that's exactly what happens to us. In that we remain exactly the same, except all we are are a spiritual essence. Uh, and we, we leave our body behind. So that, if you like, is, is equivalent to our soul. So what, um, what was being seen by the scientists on that occasion was virtually um, the spirit of the crystal, as we are spirit people ourselves. Yeah. Uh, and when we die, we simply go back to the spirit world, which is where we originally come from, all of us. Uh, and th this was, in a way, was actually uh, illustrating... Um, the whole process of death anyway, in that the spiritual essence remains after the body has died. And you also had a very important experience that was uh, very personal for you when you saw your deceased uh, mother, father and sister and you were able to embrace them, to touch them during the session? Exactly, yeah, yes, yes, I did indeed. Mm. And that was very close to my birthday on uh, on one of the years that we were sitting uh, and they were all there at the same time uh, in, in the seance room. I mean, we we actually had, during the course of, of the Skoll experiment, mm. we had on occasions up to about 10 or 11 spirit people mm. in the room all at the same time. Um, but on this occasion, say my mother, my father, my sister were all there. Um, we were able to, I was able to talk with them, talk together. And they mentioned things that only I would have known about. Um, so it was wonderful proof of uh, an evidence of an afterlife. Uh -huh. So it was a clear uh, representation of the continuity of their personalities. Indeed, yes, yes. I must say that uh, I was searching all over the internet uh, trying to see what skeptics are saying about uh, these cases, about these uh, experiments. And I could see that they are trying their best to debunk it. But what drew me to your case was the quantity of evidence. Uh, many different incidents, uh, witnesses. And on top of that, uh, magician uh, James Webster was one of direct witnesses uh, of uh, school sessions. And uh, what was his conclusion on this topic? Well, he, he sat with us twice uh, and... Uh, He's gone public and said that he has no doubt whatsoever that everything he witnessed at Skull was 100% genuine because he'd, he'd been a stage magician and he, he, a member of the inner uh, magic circle in the UK. Uh, and he um, yeah. had the opportunity um, to um, examine the seance room before we started and examine the seance room after we finished. And he said, yes, definitely those things could have been done um, if uh, if all, all the, uh, 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 the equipment had been there um, for a stage magician to do it. Um, but he said it was impossible for that to be done without a whole load of equipment. Uh, and, of course, he would have known straight away if any of that had been present. Yeah, and the most important thing here is that many sets of controls were applied and many witnesses, scientists were present. 
And in 1999, uh, after that interference from the future source that you previously mentioned, uh, the report was published uh, by SPR, Society for Psychical Research, in their official proceedings. Uh, what were their conclusions and what is the status of your research today? Uh, where school experiments stand today? And do you have any plans uh, for the future on these aspects? Yeah, well, um, the school experiment was a one-off. Uh, it was an amazing set of phenomena. Yeah. Uh, and through the website that I, I now run, a free website for anybody that's interested, um, I, I'll actually just give the name of it in case anybody course, is interested. Definitely, definitely. Um, it's HTTP, um, two dots, um, two slashes, um, physical mediumship four, and it's the, it's the number four and the letter U. Um, so it's physical mediumship four, you dot ning n i n g dot com uh and through that we have um two thousand two hundred people all over the world now um who are very interested in the subject are themselves learning an awful lot about it through um the basic guide that was uh, that was dictated by our spirit team uh and there are some wonderful mediums who have developed on there. Uh, there's a wonderful German medium called Kai Muga. There's an English medium who moved out to Australia called David Thompson. Both of them getting wonderful phenomena, although they, it is both ectoplasm, ectoplasm based in their case. Um, but plans for the future. Well, Sandra and I have continued to be heavily involved in it. Um, we are planning to continue with our, our own group a new group in the very near future over wow. here in Spain. That's we found a few people in Spain that are very interested in the subject. Do you have any contacts uh, with scientists, maybe behind the scenes, who are interested and who are following this type of research and phenomena? Um, from time to time we do. Um, I know the mediums certainly keep themselves to themselves, Diana yeah. and Alan Bennett. Um, I, I don't have any knowledge of them ever giving interviews about their work. And I don't think they ever they, they do similar work now. Um, but uh, I've had contact with a number of people. Um, I've done a few interviews, television, radio, and so forth now. Um, I, I do a little bit of, uh, of lecturing. Um, Sandra and I are actually going out to Norway in, um, in September to do a bit there. Um, and I've helped with Sandra. We've helped to actually set physical mediumship up in Spain, Friends of ours have got a centre out here, uh, and through them and our connections, we've invited physical mediums out, uh, and we've we've given seminars and uh, festivals of physical mediumship out here in Spain. So that has certainly um, um, been very much a forward thing, and we hope that that will continue. That's beautiful. Uh, just to quickly repeat my question about the conclusion uh, of official proceedings of SPR, and maybe just a few words about your book, where listeners will be able to find extensive details about uh, school experiments. Yes, the um, the SPR, in, in their um, report, the Skull report, uh, came out very much in favor. Um, they, they were forced to allow skeptics within the SPR to have their say. But the three um, scientists that sat with us made a wonderful job of that report uh, and came out with a conclusion that everything they witnessed was 100% genuine. So it's, it's the, the book itself is a very thick book. It's just been republished. Uh, and uh, they ran out quite quickly, I believe, the SPR themselves. But another organization has republished it, and it's now available on Amazon. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it really has got that conclusion that uh, it's 100% genuine. Um, my own book, mm. Witnessing the Impossible, is the only um, true and uh, complete story of every sitting that we had in the Skull Group. And if anybody is interested on that, then there is a website, Com, uh, and they can, uh, they can go into that and see the book itself. And... In, in addition, um, in that side, if anybody's interested, they can also get the, um, uh, get the basic guide. 
thank you, Robin, so much for allowing me to interview you. Uh, I personally think that this is one of the most important stories in our world and that we should continue to pay attention. We should continue to research and follow your work. Uh, your data and experiences that you were able to compile with your group, uh, they moved uh, this topic to a completely new level, to a completely new standards. And uh, even the skeptics are trying their best uh, to find any kind of uh, error. <laughs> the interesting <laughs> yeah. thing was that the, yeah. um, uh, the scientists in um, the Skull Report, and since the Skull Report, they've have all passed a spirit themselves now, uh, but they actually put out a challenge for anybody that felt um, that what happened at Skoll was not genuine um, to repeat it under under identical conditions. Nobody, <laughs> but nobody, has ever actually attempted to do that. I think those are the best uh, concluding uh, words. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Robin, for sharing with me today uh, your insight into school experiments. Great. Well, thanks very much yeah. indeed. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Really?